The Nine Years Podcast. All right, everybody, and welcome to the Nine Years Podcast with Nick Draper and Stuart Deacons, episode 86 this week. Now, Stuart, of course, 1986 was a very important year in the history of Wimbledon's Football Club, if you'd like to remind the listeners why. 86, that was promotion to the Football League. Sorry, Football League, Division 1, I believe. Yeah, there we go. Yes. First time we played or won promotion to the top flight of English football, but now... If memory serves me correctly, this was before your first game as Wimbledon fan, and this was a good eight years before I was even born. So we don't have a lot to reminisce about, really, between the two of us. So I've looked at some of the other, some of the other things that happened in 1986 that were of interest, okay. or that might interest the listeners. Did you know that in 1986, Alex Ferguson was appointed manager of Manchester United? Well, then he certainly stayed there and didn't leave. And he, yeah, it took him 20, 30 odd years before he left. Um, it was also the year 1986 where the Today newspaper was launched. Oh, that, that was in the first colour paper, wasn't it? First colour released paper. I don't know. I, I have only ever lived in a world of colour. Um, See, that's just your age. I know. I've also only lived in a world of GCSEs, but that was the year that they were introduced to replace O levels. It was also the year, would you believe, that Casualty and Neighbours debuted on the BBC. Wow. It was all going on, wasn't it? It was all kicking off. And then Home and Away started because, if I remember back properly, it was obviously Kylie Minogue was on Neighbours and then Danny Minogue was on the rival Home and Away. Uh, what was Natalie and Brulia on? Oh. By Paul Raymond. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I did. I must say, I did have a soft spot for Natalie and Brulia. Brulia. And Brulia. Yeah. Isn't that a type Sh- of French dessert? I don't know. She did um, Torn, didn't she? The um, all-time, say all-time classic. It was a bit of a classic tune. Yes, she did. She did. Anyway, also, last thing about 1986. Did you know, Stuart, was the year in which Randy Savage won his first and only WWF Intercontinental Championship? Interesting. No, I didn't know that. Mm, he would go on to lose that at WrestleMania three, of course, against Ricky Steamboat in an all-time classic. And of course, last week I was at WrestleMania 33, so there you go. I was going to say, what are we on now? 33, eh? 33. It's like, you know, like um, the old now, now this is what we call music. It just keeps going on and on and on, doesn't it? They've stopped actually referring to the number officially because Vince McMahon, the owner of the WWF, or WWE, I should say, thinks it makes them sound old, which is... True. True. Anyway, speaking of old, hello, Stu. <laughs> Would you like to be your top seven list this week? <laughs> Cool. It's quite interesting that you're talking about 1986, obviously, when we got promoted into the Football League Division 1, as it was then. Um, I'm actually looking through the 1985-86 season. Um, so, in no particular order, and just by the way, there's a website for these historical kits, in case people want to check of how good these kits are, or other ones that they may think are better. So, the Derby County, where they had an all-white kit, with the Bass logo, which I quite like, they were Division 3 at the time. Um... Tottenham Hotspur, their home kit, when they had the Holston as sponsors, um, and they had like quite a fancy design on there. West Broms, um, I picked this because they nothing particular in the kit, but they actually look like their sponsorship is a no smoking sign. Um, and it, I've looked here and it looks really like that, so it's quite funny. Of course, our Wimbledon kit at the time was the all blue with yellow trim, and the John Lennon sponsorship, who can figure that. I have picked, you're not going to like it too much, mate, but the Watford home kit, um, they had the Solvay, Solvay sponsorship with like red and beer. I think I quite like that kit. Um, who can forget the Everton kit that year, which was the blue with the top white half of it, and that was the NEC sponsorship. And finally, I always like the QBR kit with the dark blue and white hoops and the Guinness sponsorship. Um, so I've got for sponsorships really rather than the kits because some classic sponsors going back into that year. That was a great feature for a podcast. Yes. Yes. I am. What website was this found on? His, it was on historical historical kits. Kits. It was called. Uh, I was just looking through what kits were around and um, stumbled across it. It doesn't have every year, but it does have 1985 86. But um, 
Yeah, some really basic kits, really basic kits compared to some of the others now we have. Compared to what you have today, certainly yeah. six fantastic choices there. Of course. I'll leave you and the listeners to decide which one was clearly a little bit rubbish. Talking about rubbish, or should I say trash? Because my top seven list this week is simply my top seven American terms that I'm going to try and use in my day-to-day life back here in good old UK, following my American adventure. Words that they use which we don't, which I thought, well, let's just try and introduce them and see if I can get away with them, see if anyone will say anything. So, I promise over the next few months to say the following words and see if anyone corrects me. They are washcloth, sidewalk, railroad, diaper guardrail, zucchini, and of course, fanny pack. <laughs> I wondered if you were going to put that in. <laughs> Everybody loves a fanny pack. Hello, my name is Mr. Burns. I believe you have a letter for me. Okay, Mr. Burns. Uh, what's your first name? I don't know. All right, last week, if you remember, we spoke about the defeat at Port Vale, and... We didn't really have much to talk about, did we, Stu, really? There wasn't a great deal to discuss. I would suggest we might have a similar problem this week as we discuss our defeat to Bristol Rovers, which was a tremendous non-event, really. But alongside that, we'll have all the usual two-word tango. We'll have a poly on go. We're also going to look this week at the top 50 players in the Football League as announced by 442 Magazine and highlighting some interesting picks shall we say and giving our opinions on those that made that list but let's attempt let's attempt to discuss this bristol rovers game i think i'm right in saying that we witnessed the fastest goal in all of professional football this season i don't believe there has been a faster goal in the english football league at least this season apparently i've heard a rumor that it is bristol rovers's fastest Ever goal. Well, um, it's got to be some. It's eleven seconds, so I'm not surprised. I don't know what our record is for the fastest goal. And obviously, obviously, women don't all previous. Obviously, my record is six seconds. Six seconds. Yeah. Who's that against? I can't say. <laughs> Let's move on quickly. Uh, uh, <laughs> and, um, but it's going to be quite long for some people. But anyway, um, to, have a, to lose a game in 11 seconds, which is what we basically did, wasn't it? You know, 11 second goal, killed the game, dropped down. Good night. Um, but yeah, this point in goal, um, don't look at it back, and you can, yeah, fortunately, you can pick faults all over the place, can't you, really? And um, mainly probably from George Frankham, and then following our midfield, Alfie Egan looks a little bit slow off the mark, but yeah, 11 seconds to consider goal is just shocking. Right, you've mentioned two players there, I have to ask. Number one, George Frankham. Why is it George Franken? Why is it he at fault for the goal? Because it's the wide. If you look at the ball, it's a wide diagonal. It's a wide diagonal ball. So they play. They take centre. They knock it to the right of their centre halfway halfway line, and it's just a straight diagonal. Um, the man who's being picked up by George Franken is the person that wins the header, uh, and George just looks all at sea. Yes, you could argue that it does well come out and take everything there but the ball really is going into George Franklin's right back area and um, we did push on the funny thing is we were pushed on George was pushed on the whole game in terms of the, actual, the wide of the of the three backs but it was just a way did pick up his man and then ball went into the edge of the area and all you can really see is Alfie late going in you could argue it could be him we've seen um just pick up that, but it was just a slap, a slap goal, and um, in the end, it cost us. Now, before we just carry on, I'm going to make a little apology to the listeners. Technical difficulties we seem to be experiencing at the moment on the podcast. So, apologies if Stu's audio is a little bit broken up. That's from time to time. But the other mention you name there is Alfie Egan. That's harsh, isn't it? To put blame on him, considering in that formation that we had, he was sort of pushed on, wasn't he? In the midfield three, he was almost pushed right up behind the strikers. So. What could he have possibly done wrong for the goal? Oh, yeah, you're right. It was. It was pushed up. But when you bear in mind that that was from the centre, um, so we were combating to that time. Um, all, I, all I can see is that Alfie, we were obviously not too sure who was due to pick up the players, but Alfie was the one player that you could see getting closest to pick up. So you could argue that he was trying to cover someone else's role. But um, it just was a, a, one, a straight 
diagonal ball from a centre should not really catch you out that easy. Um, but maybe it just shows you how sl- um, how slack we are really at the moment and the pressure. No matter how many times Neil Wiley tries to say we're going to try and finish the season off on a high, the players are not, well, they're not really taking heed of that, are they? But on the whole, we, I don't think we did too badly. Over the course of the 90 minutes, we had a lot of possession and we were certainly chasing an equaliser, but did the early goal allow Bristol Rovers just to sit off and keep their shape and frustrate us and not really need to have to come out at any point to try and or give us the opportunity to try and exploit some space in behind? Yeah, so all you've got to do is look at Bristol Rovers' last 10 games and you'll see that they've had a little one or draws, one nil wins. Um, they got a 3-0 defeat, um, which was in, um, inflicted by Berry. But if you look at their results, they don't score much, they don't see much. So... That's obviously natural with May, with May Taylor being sold to Bristol City, so they've lost quite a lot of goals there. But it just it allowed them, you know, in all seriousness, you know, we chatted. Did, you and I really didn't think at any point we really had that real concerted pressure that was going to result in a goal. I, I didn't feel we were going to score all day. I don't know about you. Uh, well, no. But was that more to do with just a feeling of malaise amongst the crowd than it was what was actually going on in the pitch. that makes sense? We weren't really... There was no atmosphere, really, was there, at all, in the game. And sometimes you need that lift from the crowd that makes you get behind the players and think, right, there's an equaliser here. But no, we didn't have that sense of a goal coming. And did that then get through to the players? Yeah, yeah it, it does, doesn't it? Because the atmosphere... If you, right, to give you an example, if you compare the atmosphere for... Saturday's game against Bristol Rovers and the atmosphere against Milton Keynes. Two different games, two different atmospheres. And you could argue that we run 10% harder or we, you know, we try that. It's percentages, but what I'm saying is the crowd drive you on sometimes when you hear a lot of people say about a 12th man, you know, you look at Liverpool with a cop and stuff like that. When they're shooting towards a cop, all of a sudden it's felt like that ball's been basically, you know, taken into the net by the fans in that sort of sense. On Saturday, you could argue that people were just topping up their tans, really. And that's not just not being disrespectful to the women and fan base, but ultimately, there was no real, there was no real passion from the fan base, and I think it, it transcends to the players then as well. And no matter how much we say that we want to finish our season strong, we also realistically know we're safe. We're not really going to get relegated now. We're not going to push into the playoffs, and we've got another season back at, at Kings Meadow in League One, which we all wanted, and it feels like now we've all accepted it, and the players now really how the fans are. Are they not playing for contracts, though? Is that not the argument for the players? But although they might have accepted that we've done our job this season, the aim for the season was to remain in this division. We've done that. Now, surely for the players, it's, I want to be here next season. I need to prove my worth, because budgets at this club they'll know I'm not the biggest and there's going to have to be a decision made on every single player because we have to do the best for our club we have to do the best with a limited amount of money so tough decisions will have to be made it's an interesting you're right it's an interesting question because ultimately we've we've moved so quickly from when we started um you know, 15 years ago, we've we've moved so when we you know you and I remember the days of going to the seven day approach we, we, you, know, you play a player, we did it with Richard Butler, we did it with um, Kevin Cooper. Then you move into conference and all of a sudden you might, you know, the first professional contract or full-time contract. But realistically now, we've got players that are on two-year contracts. So do they need... To, so some players already have a contract lined up. Some people have the option, you're right. And some we probably, some may already already know, actually, that, are oh, you going to get another contract? So I suppose if you're thinking about that team at the moment that was out there on Saturday... Interesting to think how many actually really had that extra that extra need to win a contract. I, I can only think of top of my head. I'm thinking of a couple, and they might be the older stages. Although Paul Robinson's just got a contract, doesn't he? So Danny Ball would be one that I think might be fighting for a contract. Um, off the top of my head, I can't think of many others. George Franklin. There's a pregnant pause <laughs> yeah, after the name that's... George Franklin is mentioned. But do you, do you see what do you see what I mean? It's like you know you wonder how many are really playing for contracts at the moment. George Franklin didn't have a bad game on Saturday. I didn't think. 
I know we've I know we've spoken about him already about the goal one, but amongst our fan base, I think it's fair to say that he is a player that does receive more attention than others currently. But I didn't think he had a bad game at all on Saturday. Really, I think he looked quite composed in certain situations. Deliveries weren't bad, as a general rule. Some decent balls in the box. Not his fault if we perhaps don't have the personnel on the pitch to really make the most of our set-piece opportunities on Saturday. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I just don't think 3-5-2 works for us. I, I don't know why. Did we play it because of the sickness plug? You know, could we have played a different formation with the players we had out there? You could argue we could have played a 4-4-2. We could have played a 4-3-3. Um, I just don't know whether 3-5-2 just doesn't suit George at home. I, we don't get any width. You know, he was... You could definitely see that George and and Chris Kelly as well were... Um, Higher up the pitch. What's Chris, so, Ke- what's Chris Kelly doing there? Chris Kelly. Where's Gene uh, Kelly gone? Sean Kelly, of no, course. No, Graham Kelly. We've had this before. <laughs> Kelly Kelly. Now that would be better. <laughs> Mr. But, Kelly. Yeah. <laughs> but you can notice, you see, that their starting position was quite high. So we were, you know, we were pushing when we had the possession, we were good in that sort of side of it. But I just never felt we got the width from the George Franklin side, which is funny enough, he's the winger, he's the actual right midfielder who you think would get width. But I thought we got a lot of width through Kelly and Meats. That worked better, and I thought that was more of our successful area. Um, I don't know. Uh, uh, George Franklin, I probably would give a contract to purely because of his versatility. He can play a number of positions. Um, he always works hard. I don't think I don't think you can question his work rate. Um, but... And I am at the moment, I've not seen enough for him reading the second half of the season to suggest that he's a dead cert. Um, but then you could argue there's a few others that haven't really had a good second half of the season either. I think George Franken works best when we've got a target man up front and we get him in those wide positions and he doesn't have to think. He just gets the ball, takes a touch, chucks it in the box. Because we've seen in the past how good his delivery can be and is. So if you're going to go, all right, Three five two for whatever reason we seem to be trying a few times at the moment. But if we'd go back to a four four two, him in a wide right position, perhaps all right. Pace is not his thing. Taking players on not his thing. But he's very much got that Beckham ability, which might be the only time you hear these two players mentioned in the same sentence. But just to get the ball out of his feet and chuck some quality in the box. Do you think lacking a target man on Saturday didn't help us either because of that? Yeah, possibly. We do. We normally do play with Tiger Man. Obviously, we play with Tom Edder. Um, we didn't have that. So we had two small players. I say small players, but we had Dom and Lyle up front, and that didn't really work. I would argue that Dom's not had a great end. He's had a good start to the season, didn't he? But I wouldn't argue he's been spectacular since January. Probably so. Um, yeah, I think so. I think yeah, George can. When we we seen George play, I remember going back to when he played against Pompey. If I remember, we won. We won there. He played. In, he played in just in just in behind uh, the midfield area, and he was able to dictate play because he can pass it. You know, George is good with a passing ability, and when he's got in, and he, he can play in that centre midfield area. Um, I just don't know whether though George is going to be a utility man, and do we having a utility man is fine, but. Do we, you could, you know, next season, do we, for I say, put Cynic into the right back position? He's a right back. So are we, are we stifling our progression from our academy or our under 21s for someone who we feel is just going to be an, 20, uh, an utility man who probably is on more salary and taking that budget away from one of our academy people? I think that's where I, I look with George at the moment. Are we stifling through um, our players coming through because you know we're going to move on to Alfie Egan no doubt very quickly and he's been stifled a little bit because of that that blockage Jonathan Meads next season as a utility player is that your argument there for saying George thank you but no thank you does it waste Jonathan Meads where is Jonathan Meads' best position (laughs) well the difference with Jonathan Meads is that he can play in number positions very well whereas I think George can play in number positions Average, if I'm being, and that's not being disrespectful to George. It's just being George can play those positions. But when Jonathan Meade steps into centre midfield, he looks at the accomplished centre midfield. He played right back. He played left back. Um, when George goes, well, sorry, when Jonathan Meade goes forward, he Jonathan Meade is very stylish on the ball. He's got good foot, good ability, a good sense of danger, good sense of pass, good balance. Um, he's one of the players that I'd always, I'm always worried he's going to play too well. 
because we obviously know we've we've got scouts and actually is always two at the ground, but we've had Liz Fernand um, there a couple of times. And my worry is that he's going to look at someone like John and Mees. I think there's other players we could uh, push, replace, but John and Mees is quite important to us and uh, an excellent player. Alfie Egan is an excellent player. You've mentioned him just there. Let's talk about him. What did you make of his performance on Saturday, given a start at long last? I think we were all very, very happy to see him get an opportunity. He lasted, what, an hour? Yeah. What did you make of his hour? Yeah, really promising. Um, a shame, really, that the way the game went, obviously, seeing the goal so early, sort of changed the way the game was going to play out because, of course, we had a possession where... Alfie, I think, would be it'd be interesting to see Alfie in a game where it was nil nil maybe or if we got the early goal, where that space then becomes available. Um I've said to you before, haven't I, when I've seen Alfie in the twenty ones this season, um that he's very he's very clever in terms of he picks up positions that are very good. Um he's very much his first intention is to get into the box. So he reminds me of that Robbie L sort of type player. Um Without being, without putting any pressure on Alfie Egan, which was obviously Robbie was a, a superb player. But yeah, George Frankham, David Beckham, and now <laughs> Alfie Egan and Robbie Earl. <laughs> but it's that ability to get into the box. It was that you know he has that you know he he, he plays a pass. He, he's not one like a, a Jake Reeves who will play a pass and then will sit and wait for the the out ball if it's needed. Alfie, if he knocks the ball wide, his next intention is can I get into the box or can I get into an area um, to get a goal? And you saw we hit you know he hit the crossbar with a shot. Um, he played how I thought, you know, I was really pleased. He said, you know, 10 minutes he had to, he didn't, you know, it just flew by. And you can imagine that's the excitement. Um, but it was nice words from Ryan Sweeney um, after the game on the um, the official site, which he said, Alfie you know, did very well. And he said, like, you know, you got in between the lines, was difficult to pick up. And that's what Alfie will give us. Um, I just hope now we get him a couple of games for the season and we use him more next year. I'm, you know, I'm looking at the stats. He's had 20 games... 20 games he's been on the bench, not come off it. He's come off the bench four times um, to have minutes. He's only had two starts. So I'd have, I'd have been hoping Alfie would have got more this year. Um, definitely should be getting more that next year. It's one of those situations where you tend to notice the player more because you are making a point of watching him because perhaps the game for us doesn't have a particular great amount of importance. I tend to pick out a couple of players and really watch them. And Alfie, I think a lot of us were focused on. And certainly, for me, who hasn't seen a great amount of him, definitely have to say his movement was fantastic. You're right, just always looking just to pick up those little spaces, get on the ball and make something happen. So, very, very promising. I think another player you've mentioned there is someone else that I think a lot of eyes were trained on. I think it's fair to say, had I not been looking out for Ryan Sweeney on Saturday to see how he's getting on, I probably wouldn't have noticed him, which I always think is the biggest compliment you can play a a centre-half. Yeah, but you know, the funny thing about Ryan Sweeney is that it's no surprise, and we've, we've, you know, Ryan is a friend of the show because we've had him so many times on here, but he's not, it doesn't surprise me that Stoke are the one that seems to picked him up because he is a typical Stoke defender. He's a no nonsense defender. You know, if you look at it a couple of times, if you look at the two different, so the, I, you know, we think about this season when we started the season, we had Will Nightingale, Ryan Sweeney, who probably were, were toying for third or fourth choice centre half. You've got, Will, who is comfortable with uh, the ball at his feet, will try and play balls, can come into areas. Ryan Sweeney, he, he won't do that. He'll pick a position up, he'll defend well, and he'll knock it out. It, it's more of a case of, do you know what, we, they can't score from a throw in the old saying, oh, knock it out, regroup, start again. You can't score from that way. Where, So, to me, he's just got bigger. He just seems like he's not stopped growing. But he's a no-nonsense defender. He's a no-nonsense defender. You can see why Bristol Rovers love him, because you can see they're very solid with him in there. And Will Nightingale was voted the nine years Twitter man of the match. Let's tidy this one up now. He got 57% of the vote. Jonathan Meads, Lyle Taylor and Chris Kelly, apparently, split the vote, the remaining vote, almost equally between them, 14, 16 and 13% respectively. Would you like some three-word reports? Yes, definitely. I was hoping you were going to say no, just for the... Hilarity. <laughs> well, I know we did. We, I know we had them. There were some the ones that I saw come through in our Twitter feed were quite um, encouraging. Encouraging. Well, it cheered me up because I was really not really too happy after the result. Fair enough. Uh, give you three that we received. Ray Armfield making his return to the show at Kent Womble. Foot off gas. <laughs> I like it. Very good. Tommy Walger at Womble. Tom Rover and out. 
Rubbish. And M Sturgy Boy at Dummy Out the Pram went for Gas Trick Problems. Mm. So there you are, three friends of the show there. Thank you very much right. for your three word reports. Thank you very much for putting the hashtag Don's three word reports. We could find them nice and easily. All good. I think that's pretty much all we've got to say for Bristol Rose. We can get that one out of the way, can't we? Yeah, to be honest with you, we spoke about it longer. Well, we spoke longer than that, and then we did actually win the game for So, <laughs> boom, boom. I see what you did there. I oh, know, it's quite clever, isn't it? No, um, let's move on. Let's do a two-word tango. Ah, oh, yes, of course. Now, I was having a thought before we went on air, just as I was preparing for the show. As you know, I prepare thoroughly of course, each yes. and every week <clears throat> for the podcast. I was thinking of maybe in tribute to Borussia Dortmund, who have had a very difficult couple of days. Yes. We maybe do teams that play in yellow. Oh, I like that. But they have to be their home colours. Oh. Yeah. But then I thought, we can do this worldwide. It doesn't just have to be English teams, because I think we'd be a bit stuck if it was. Yes. So you can do international teams and... Yeah, and maybe if they have, like, yellow stripes or something, do you know what I mean? It doesn't have to yes. be completely all yellow. Okay. But we're not going to include Wimbledon. Well, that's not fair, because you said all teams. Yeah, but we're not having Wimbledon. Okay. Because we have very minimal yellow in our kit. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah let's go for it. Let's okay. go for it. All right. Do you want to go first? Um... Yeah, I think I should do because it might give me a chance. Okay. I'm, all right, whatever you say. Okay, should we just go with it? <laughs> let's just, <laughs> yeah, let's just go with it. Here we go. Gotta listen out for this guy. It's a famous name, but don't flop. Something like Sebastian Coe. Celebrity to word tango. Burton Albion. Ecuador. Australia. Oh. Oxford United. Norwich City. Brazil. Oxford United. I've already said it. Oh, oh wow. Come damn. on. That was rubbish. That was rubbish. Did you really say Oxford already? Yes. Ah, oh, damn. Do you not think Borussia Dortmund? <laughs> <laughs> I know. That's what it's tied off as. Oh, uh, you know what the funny thing is? Um I'm not too sure if people have seen it, but obviously we we did this with Jonathan Meads and um, Tom Elliott on Saturday after Bristol Rovers. Obviously, game. however it's not obvious obviously. to those people well, who haven't seen it. It's it just been released on Wednesday, so please go and have a look at it. It's um, it's it's very funny. But I laughed at them because of how poor they were. But they lasted longer than we did on that one. Or I did on that one. Yes, that was pretty poor. I had a whole stack of them lined up. I know. I well, know. I had the Trump one. I thought I'd just wait until you were struggling and I was going to chuck Watford in because I knew you wouldn't want that. No, I was hoping um, you'd get that out of the way first because I was desperate not to say it. <laughs> I know. That's why I knew you wouldn't say it. So I thought when it got really sort of like, I expected to get a little bit further into that game. Obviously, it didn't. Um, oh, I can even say Saturday United, which we had, obviously, was the the topic of discussion. Yes. Damn. Yes. Yeah, I know. You could have had Saturday United. You could have had, who did I have next? Southport I had lined up. That's Maidstone United, Torquay United, Villarreal. There were loads. It's rubbish, isn't it? I'm so glad now we're getting the players to do it instead of me. I'm rubbish at this We're game. still doing this every week, Stu. Damn. I'm afraid to say. Oh, right. well, well done, you won. You did very well to Thank win that. Thank you. I yeah. win every week. Do you ever notice this? Even Newport County we could have done. Oh, I wouldn't know. I just, no, I don't think so. They're playing yellow. They're orange, aren't they? Yeah, if you look, if you look under the floodlights, there it becomes yellow. You can say that for anyone. <laughs> Um, do you want to mention them? You mentioned talking about Jonathan Meads and Tom Elliott doing a two-word tango. Should we mention what else we've been up to this week then? What other things can be found on YouTube? Yeah, on the so... the official AFC Wimbledon YouTube account, I believe. Yes, definitely. So we um, we did some stuff, we did some features for the club on, on Saturday that have found their way onto the official YouTube and Facebook. And you'll be seeing advertised on Twitter. So we had an interview with Kelly Jade William from the um, all-conquering AFC Women and Ladies team. That is Kelly Jade Whelan, and just because Stu's got a bit of a problem, I've noticed. So not Noel Whelan, not Glenn just, Whelan. What did I say? Kelly Jade Whelan. Yes. Yes. Cool. Not Chris Kelly. 
<laughs> so we had an interview her on the, um, the uh, YouTube, the official site. And also we introduced our two-word tango game to the players. So that's something we're going to be hopefully doing more um, this season and stuff like that. So we had a good two-word tango, and I won't spoil the fun, but just to say, it definitely showed the banter within the dressing room. It got that competitive edge, didn't it? Um, with them and Nick was the um, referee controlling it all and did a very good job um, but yes yeah, so you may have seen Nick and I around the ground with the microphone and stuff like that so that's something that hopefully we're going to be doing a bit more of yes fingers crossed and hopefully next time we do a two word tango wherever it might be or whichever players we have I won't look quite so awkward wedged in between them <laughs> with a most almighty massive microphone <laughs> with a huge microphone now luckily I have a lot of experience in handling things that large <laughs> however having to handle something else at the same time was a little bit tricky the most funniest thing is when you watch this is that Nick uh, literally about halfway through realises that he should be moving the microphone as the players are answering but does it in the most you have to realise that Nick still was jet lagged um, it was a still long am jet lagged still am jet lagged it was a long day we we got there for about quarter past twelve and it was it was fun but it was hectic so we we recorded that about six o'clock because uh, John and me had to have some treatment and stuff and um, yeah it it was tiring, but we just want to say, obviously, thank you to the thank you to the club and um, people behind the scenes who gave us that access. It was um, yes, it was very um, it was very good, wasn't it, to get access and Tom Meads, sorry, Tom Meads, Tom, Tom, Jeez, and, here we go, and, uh, and John Meads were great sports, and um, yes, the winner was very happy. He was indeed. He was indeed right. Another winner we're going to talk about this week, is the winner of 442 Magazine's Top 50 Football League Players, which was a fascinating read this month. So, they do this every year, okay? And they say inside the pages of what is, let me just check, the May 2017 edition of the magazine, they say that they've taken a poll of fans from all... 71 legitimate and one illegitimate football league club. And I think, did we work it out, Stu, that they rank their top five players that they've seen this season? Now, I'm assuming that's excluding players from their own club. Otherwise, it wouldn't work, would it? Yeah, so five points for first place and then down to fifth. So I suppose it then gives. And this is basically it's the, the top five players that they have seen um, so bearing in mind that some clubs obviously, you know, if I would say if you and I had said what are the best teams that have been down at Kings Matter, we could probably, if from the top of my head, would be a team like Scunfort was Scunfort, Sheffield United. So my players probably would come from those teams. Now I'm somewhat sceptical if that's the only criteria for making this list, because if that was the case, it should be a fairly even spread across the divisions, but clearly the list is heavily biased towards championship players. So I can only assume they must have weighted something in their favour. Because you would expect the top 50 Football League players, essentially, to be majority from the championship. But that's fair enough. But on a fan's vote, it would never be the case. It would be an even split, wouldn't it? So, yeah. And I'm also a little bit dubious of some of the picks in here. I think it's convenient that an ex-striker of ours has made the top 50 <laughs> Um, Adebayo Akinfenwa coming in 50th place. I think that is convenient. I find it, if I'm being honest, I do find it unlikely that he'd have made it from a vote of League 2 fans. No, but I suppose he's a popular person. He's had a, to be fair, Bayo's had a good season um, down League 2, isn't he? He's had a good season, but yeah, you're right. Um, when I saw Bayo at number 50, I'm like, OK, well, he had to be in there, didn't he? Yeah, he did, does make you wonder. It's good for publicity if then Bayo can then tweet out that he's made the top 50 list. It's good for their magazine sales. How sceptical and cynical can I be? But anyway, with a League One eye then, the top 10 players in this list did all come from the championship, of which the most notable, if you're interested, number one was Anthony Knockhart of Brighton and Hove Albion. The most notable name in the top 10 aside from that would be, I would say, well, there's two actually, Connor Hurahane and Scott Hogan, only because we've encountered both of those in League 2 over the past few years, haven't we? So, Yeah, in the top five, I'm not surprised if Fulham players in there. Tom Cairn is in there. Um, I'm not surprised that Fulham had a great season. Um, Chris Wood uh, from Leeds. Damn. Is, he, is he Leeds' best player? I don't know. Uh, I don't know, there's a few others in there that, um, I don't know the names that escape me, but there's a few others in there that I, I'm trying to think now, the little, 
if I try no, it's not if I try but it's a little little player at Leeds I will get his name but that makes no people go little player shoe what does that mean but um, no it's a player at Leeds who I think has had a great season and they rate really highly um, so I'm surprised Chris Woods who basically is a target man in all in all sense of it do you know what I mean so um, I'm going to find as we're talking I'm going to find who that player is because it's going to start bugging me but um yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? You know, top five. Two Newcastle players in there, Jojo, Jojo Shelby and Dwight Gale. Um, they've had a good season, but then they're expected to. They kept a very, very good squad, didn't they, from last season? So is that really that much of a surprise? Not really. Dwight Gale, of course, another player, I suppose, we came up against, didn't we, for Dagenham and Redbridge? Yeah, we remembered did. that, yeah. Before he moved on to Crystal Palace. By somewhere else, I thought. I can't remember where. He went, was it Peterborough he went to? Yes. That's correct. Because Peter, Peterborough, by every player that's um, any player that's going to do well, Peterborough would have some sort of um, say in him. <laughs> yeah, any young sort of non-league or lower league player does seem to find their way through Peterborough. Or at least they did over the last few years. But anyway, the top League One then current League One player, current for at least four more games at least, is Billy Sharp. He came in at eleventh, the Sheffield United captain and leading scorer, I believe. So probably, perhaps, no real surprise there from either of us. That's probably fair enough, isn't it? But the player you liked was Josh Morris at Scunthorpe, and he has come in at 15th. Yeah. If you look at, if you look at the goals that he's got, uh, a lot of free kicks, um, but just quality free kicks. I don't know his assists, I don't know his assist uh, ratio, like, but he's been instrumental for Scunthorpe, but probably noticeably when he's not you know, got not got the score sheets going for haven't done too well. Obviously they've had a bit of a slump, but um I think he's been brilliant uh, this season. Yeah, it seems to have been it seems interesting. You've also got the the little Messi from Warsaw, the Polish guy, um, who's got in the seven teams. You've got Osuma Os- uh, Tuma. Warsaw, who I think that's good also for the things that, you know, for the little people in the world who, you know, about five foot nothing who look up to everyone. It's good to know that they can have a place on a football pitch, Nick, isn't it? Anyone else you want to insult? Add to the list. I'll have you know, Alexa Bliss is only five foot tall. She's very small, but that's been no barrier to her success. Joe, you know what? You're pretty good. At, you're pretty good to shoot me down for this. But one player that I was surprised wasn't in there. And it's one player I don't really like, but I have to begrudgingly say that I think he's getting better every time I see him. Is Ricky Holmes for Charlton? I'm really surprised. I know with the Chelmsford links and stuff like that, but I thought he was brilliant down at our place. He's got a great free kick. Um, does a lot of stuff in that Charlton team, and I can see him getting a championship team. I can see him going up a level easily. It's interesting, he's not made the top 50, but he was picked as Charlton's best player. No yeah. Charlton player made the top 50, and he was picked as their best player. So, yeah. clearly, the journalists at 442 agree with you on that score. Yeah. Well, I'll, tell you what, I'll tell you one thing that I'm just shocked and. Where you said that I, you know, I think there's some face favoritism and stuff like that. But number twenty six is James Vaughan at Bury, which again I question the legitimacy of the fan voting here. Come on, we we saw him three times down at our place. Um, he was rubbish. Yes, he comes with a great pedigree. Yes, he was at Huddersfield as at Evan before that. But I thought he was a real average player. And we dealt with him really easy. I know Berry are not a great team, but if you're if you're in the if you're number twenty six in the top fifty, you've got to have some influence in games. Surely you can't just be a bystander. Um, and I thought he was really, from what a team. If you remember when we played Berry, I thought there was two players that I was really gonna, really looking out for. One was Tom Saws, who obviously we've now um, purchased for our team, um, but also James. Vaughan and I was disappointed in both of those players. Two times I was really disappointed. He comes, you know, being a being a palace. Um, but I think he got beaten up by a poor side. But James Vaughan, no, sorry, not not for me. Other names of interest before we get to James Vaughan. Twenty three is Graham Carey, obviously at Plymouth Argyle. So that seems fair enough. And then after James Vaughan, looking through the League One list, David Weeter at Bolton you might suggest, would come a little bit higher on the list as well, perhaps. But he's in at 28, and that's no real surprise, considering the good season Bolton have had. The next name in League One, would you believe? Genuinely, this is actually true, Stu. The next League One name on the list, 35, Charlie Wyke. Mm. Yep. Mm. Not surprised. If you think about it, before he got a move to Bradford, when they obviously sold off Hanson to Sheffield United. Sheffield United. Um, 
Troy White, I don't know how many goals, goals he scored for Carlisle, but they were a big reason. 13 and 16, apparently. Yeah. And look, and if you look at if you look at Carlisle now struggling to hold on to a playoff place in League Two, um, you have to. You also sometimes have to wonder: Is it sensible to get rid of your top striker in a window for January? Because look at what look at the if you look at the impact on both sides. Of it, he's gone into Bradford and the very very high by their fans and plays Hanson as if Hanson had a left. Yeah, John, so John, Carlisle, same, same. Same sort of team. Um, Carlisle, obviously, is struggling. Um, interesting, I'm just looking at 33, Tom Ince. How yeah. the mighty have fallen. Yeah, but would you realistically put him in... Surely he would fall... Well, OK. The person or the player one place above him in the list is <laughs> Danny Hilton. Now, let's be honest. Let's be honest here. If you're a Premier League manager looking next season thinking, hmm, let's try and get... A player in that's going to help Tom Ince or Danny Tom, Ince or Hilton Ince or Hilton hmm. Hmm. but you know what I, I might get shot down about, I might get shot down about this again and you'll know because I've spoken to you many times about it. I, I really like Danny Hilton is at our place I bet, um, r- as of this moment right now I am a huge Danny Hilton fan of course I assume yes. he's playing for Luton he Sound. plays for Luton yes and scores goals for Luton and is absolutely fantastic for Luton but but he was top goal scorer. His run with us was particularly memorable. No, but you could you could see that he had ability. You could see he was a rugged sort of like oh, how can I put it? A typical old like Lee two striker, like a Steve Clarridge. Can I put him like that? Really, he's gonna he's gonna upset you. He's gonna he's gonna tackle you. He's gonna hit you. He's gonna do all that sort of stuff. But I really liked him. You could see why he got goals. But then Oxford Oxford didn't want to lose him. I think they offered him, from memory, I think they offered him a new contract. He didn't want that. He went to Luton. Obviously, he paid loads of money because that's what Luton do. No offence, but Luton do chuck money at players. Um, and now he's top goal scorer at Luton, isn't he? So, he could be back in League One. I say back. I don't think he's playing League One. But he's a type of, he's a type of striker that I think we don't have. Uh, a person just gets in those sort of areas and that sort of thing. But um, I, I like Danny Hilton. Connor Ripley. Next League One player at 44. Yes. How many people listening right now are going, who is Connor Ripley? Yeah, silence is golden, isn't it? Yeah, he is the goalkeeper for Oldham. Apparently, he's on loan from Middlesbrough. Now, this is where I start to wonder if the fan voting does apply. <laughs> because probably, like ourselves, who drew nil-nil with Oldham earlier in the season, we're probably thinking goalkeepers probably had a good game. And that might be the case for Oldham this year. Especially under John Sheridan, who I think has really tightened up defensively since yeah. he's come in. Yeah, and you know he's not he's not the only goalkeeper in that top in that top forty as such because you've also got the swimming goalkeeper we'll be facing on Good Friday, um, Lawrence Bigarol, who is a chilling goalkeeper. I don't know if he's French by his surname, but he's I don't know if you he was Liverpool last year. He was there on loan at Swindon, then made a deal permanent. And I don't know if anyone can remember, you may have heard his story, but he was the person who got fined fifty pounds, um, I think because of a, a fine system they had, maybe being late, and he paid a fifty pound fine in pennies. Um, and I think if I remember properly, he got chucked straight back to Liverpool after that. But he's obviously recovered from that. Um, but I like him. I saw him. I've, I've seen him a few times. I think he's a really good goalkeeper. Um, so that makes more sense to me. But I don't understand, like you say, having a Middlesbrough loanee, um, especially for Oldham. What have Oldham done this season? He's, he's obviously had a lot of action because Oldham obviously held on the wrong end of the table. Yeah, I think that's a given, isn't it? That they must have been, or he'd have been called into action quite regularly over the course of his time with Oldham. But there we go. You look through the list, what they've done is if you, your club did not have a player in the top 50, they have highlighted who they think your best player is. As we've mentioned there, Ricky Holmes for Charlton, for example. And our entrant, I said that very strangely, I do apologise, my voice did something very, very funny there, I don't know what that was. <laughs> it's all going wrong on this week's show. Um, Paul Robinson was our choice. Now, do you think that is a case of four four two looking at it and going most experienced, perhaps looking at his time at Millwall as well for the success he had there and thinking that's why. I think if you were to watch us this season, many of us would argue that Jake Reeves, Lyle Taylor, Tom Elliott perhaps had, Darius Charles even had a better shout to that position. Yeah, and you know, by us saying that we don't think Boris would have been a choice, it's no, by no means saying that you had a bad season. But you're right, I think if we were going to have our pick, you'd probably be thinking more of a Darius... Charles, Jake Reeves, Tom Elliott. 
depends. It depends when they saw these players. If they saw Tom Elliott before Christmas, they pick him all day long. If they saw him in the last couple of months, then maybe not. Um, but yeah, it's a little bit in there, isn't it? I, yes, it's nice to see that who they've selected, but yes, probably wouldn't have been our our choice. No, and I'm just looking through the list of other names of players that didn't make the top 50 but were highlighted as their club's best player just to see if anything stands out. Northampton was an interesting one. They've gone for Matt Taylor. Again, perhaps looking at his previous career because I'm thinking Northampton, we talk about him a lot on this show but have a striker that I'd put above him. But there we go. Yeah, well, have a look. Bristol Rovers, Chris Lyons. Obviously, they, they know, no, there's no bad thing about Matt Taylor, is there? <laughs> go in all well, I was going to say Matt Taylor who actually made the list at 24 for his new club Bristol City ah good spot mm. interesting isn't it so I suppose that would have been their choice um, yeah do you know what I'm looking through here I'm looking um, interesting goalkeeper I rate who I rate really high when he's at South End um, is in, in for Brentford Dan Bentley who I think will go on a bit he's only 20 years old but he's a uh, the beast of a goalkeeper in terms of size wise. Um, what else we're looking at here? Ryan Haynes at Coventry, who apparently is rated really highly. Um, you've got James Collins, who reportedly snubbed a deal from us to go to Crawley, and then we took on the other one from Swan, we took on the one that was remaining for Shrewsbury. Um, Daddy, Braddy Dack at Gillingham. Interesting yeah. that Leighton Orient, who are in all sorts of trouble as we know. 18-year-old Miles Judd, who I thought was a very posh middle-class comedian. <laughs> they really have fallen on hard times. Yeah. If he's their best player now. And Pompey having Gary Roberts is their one, mm. which is not surprising. Gary Roberts is really good. He's only 33. I thought he was a lot older than that. Um, John Stead. John Stead right next to him, yeah. <laughs> yeah, John Stead. When you think about it, actually, Notts County, you've had a better season this season than last. Um, but, of course, just to go back into the list, and probably one that we... Are keeping an eye on and maybe not gone for yet, but John Kindy. I was just about to say that's the last thing on my list to mention with John Kindy because I'm I have seen him play this season and I was very impressed. Really? Yes. Saw him play for Barnet, as I would do because that's who he plays for, at Luton, <laughs> I think around Christmas time. And he looked worthy of his place in that list, to be honest with you, which I wouldn't have said on previous viewings of him. You have to wonder whether someone's going to go in for him this year. I, I don't. I don't see how he's how he's. I don't see how Barnett will keep hold of him. Um, I think he's their top goal scorer again this year. Age wise, he's twenty seven. So they normally say players are coming into their sort of prime around about that sort of age, isn't it? So I'd be surprised if he stays at Bayern next year. And you know, is it a player that we could be interested in potentially? Hmm. Well, it's good news for all managers looking for a cheap option for next. Well, not for next season, but over the next couple of seasons. If players, as you say, reach their prime at about 27, 28, so what, three or four years? And I'm going to be, wow, what do you reckon? I reckon I can play League Two at least. I thought you were going to say you're going to be playing for over 35s. <laughs> that would be impossible because I'm only 24. Of course. Yes. If you're interested in 442's top 50 Football League players, we've pretty much just given the game away for you, really, because we've, we've told you a whole lot. <laughs> we've told you the whole lot, really. But you can still purchase the magazine. It's Available right now in all good news agents and some rubbish ones as well. And well I can't download, believe it's download. taken us 86 episodes for me to make that joke. And yes, you were going to say you could also do what, which is what you've done? Yeah, you can all download it as I did because I don't buy anything. I don't go to news agents anymore. I didn't realise they still existed. Sorry. Um, yeah, I just download it. Not easier. Yeah, but not as so much fun. No, but I had this conversation with my fiance. She loves to make sure she buys a book. If she's going to read a book she wants to buy, I go get a mm. Kindle. Yeah, we've had this conversation before, though, haven't we? Yeah, I, I like just... the tactility of actually opening a... It's a it's the, reading it off a screen, I don't know. Kind of, the quality is better. High, high definition. I, I don't know where to begin with that statement, to be honest <laughs> with you. <laughs> and you can zoom in if you're, if you're, hard, of, if you're hard of sight. Well, you can't see. But if you can't see, no point zooming in, which won't get any better. But if you, you know, it just makes you look better, I'll stop there. That was, of all the things you've said on this show... <laughs> <laughs> that 30 seconds was the most fascinating insight into your mind I think anyone's <laughs> ever had. Should we get Polio and go on? Please. Right, the first two clues this week, Stu, you'll be glad to hear, are a little bit cryptic. 
Ah, lovely. There is a very cryptic first clue and a somewhat cryptic second clue and then a nice easy third clue and then an anagram. Okay. Hmm. So let's start with clue number one. Dom has travelled to this stadium and he is expecting this to have the widest pitch of any stadium he has visited this season. Oh. Hmm. No, nothing on the first one. No. Okay, second one. He has stopped off in the nearest pub for away fans. There is a bar at the ground, I should say. But there is a pub very close by as well, which he stopped into. And again, judging by the name of it, he thinks he needs to show off or expose 50% of his rear end. <laughs> see, I can only think of Arsenal, because of course that would be the... Oh, I see what you've done there. ...is, yeah. is back end. Now, but, the, the reason I've gone for this clue is because I thought you might know this pub, and you have been in it. So I thought there was a chance you'd get it. Well, pub-wise, right on the ground, Akron Stanley got one. Yes. Right on the ground. Well, um, need to show off. Show off. Their rear end. Their rear end. No, not making any sense to me. No? Okay. All right. Well, this stadium, and to give you a little bit of a hint, I use that word loosely, it's celebrating its 20th birthday of this season, apparently. Dom has discovered... Although the newest stand was opened in 2012. I don't like this game anymore. It's getting harder. Um, newest game, I don't know, newest stand, 20 years old, so will that be 1997? Uh, no, Bowl Wonders? Reebok? No, I don't know. No. No. Okay, the anagram clue, I've taken out the word stadium, okay? So, uh, it is the something stadium. And the anagram is Elf Dido Bra. Or <laughs> Elf Dido Bra. Elf Dido Bra. There's a sound of tumbleweed going past. I think as <laughs> Stu's brain tries to encounter what is going on. No, I'm done. I can't think of anything on this one. No? I, I've been in it. That worries me. I've been to most grounds. You, you, never, you never believe that, but I can't remember most of these clues, but no, you've done it on this one. I'm going to help you out by giving you one last clue. Okay. The I'm name of this team, you might not... <clears throat> if you're on all fours, what are you going to be doing? Kneeling. No. What are you going to do if you're all on fours? You're going to be... And you're travelling at the same time. Let's... All right. There's people's <laughs> minds right now are exploding at what I've just said. <laughs> Let's keep it clean, obviously. If you're listening and you're thinking what I think you're thinking, your mind's in the gutter. All right? Honestly, disgusting. I would never think such things. What are you doing if you're travelling but you're on all fours? <laughs> travelling but you're on all fours. If you're travelling but you're all on all... all can't say it. You're, I don't know what you're. <laughs> oh my word! Really? Yeah, it's a long day. This is painful now. What do babies do before they start walking, Christian? They crawl. So, which club are you at this week? <laughs> Crawley. There we go. Oh, it's the one round the corner from me. Yeah, the one that is actually closest to you. <sighs> now, pub, pub, rear end. Yeah, because what's the, do you know what the name of that pub is? I thought you might remember. No, I try not to remember too much about Crawley if I can, if I live around a corner from it, I try not. Yeah. It's called the Half Moon Pub. Uh, so 50% of his rear end, you see? Half Moon. Please. You get the widest pitch thing, does that make sense? No. Because the ground is called what? What's its a proper name? Well, it's known as a checker trade, isn't it? But it's now as a broad field stadium. There you go, broad field. See? <sighs> See, it's too clever. <sighs> I'd be sure I would be interested. Uh, let's do a Twitter, not to a Twitter poll, but if you got this on any of the clues, please tweet us and tell us when you got it. And if you didn't get it, be honest and say no. I did ask a few people on Saturday. They were very honest and said they'd struggled with the week before, but I think there will be a number of fans that got this one. I have to be honest. There we go. Cool. Thank you very much for that. Any time. Well, every week, in fact. <laughs>
What's happening Easter weekend? I don't care. I really don't care anymore. I shouldn't say that because I'm trying to promote the podcast, but I really don't care. Who are we playing? Swindon away on Friday. Swindon. It is getting that way, isn't it? We've got, what, four games left now. Um, obviously, two this weekend because it's Easter weekend. Then we go. It does feel like we're getting ready for our holidays, doesn't it? Well, you've had your holidays, but it does look like we're getting ready for our holidays now. Yeah, I think we are. Yeah, it's just like... Just get through these games, just get them over with and start again in August. So Swindon, you know, realistically, Swindon... I looked at their stats because, of course, the stats and what they've done the whole season is going to make... is going to play a big part in this game. Is it heck? It's a, for them, it's a, it's a relegation battle. They're, what, they're three points off. Safety, four games to play. After us, they've got Walsall at home. Sorry, Walsall away, Scunthorpe at home, Charlton away last game of the season. So, realistically, they're going to be going all out to beat us. They, they, they've only got one more home game, which is Scunthorpe. We'll see going playoffs. Um, they only scored 22 goals this season. 10 to score most of their goals in the second half. So, yes, if we can keep it nil-nil, um, don't be thinking we've got to, you know, it really depends how we go. It really does. Their danger man is a Jose. A Jose? A Jose? A Jose? Kelly. Chris yeah. Kelly. <laughs> the player they got from Nicky or Jose. Nicky or Jose. The player they got who done nothing at Charlton, then went then went to Swindon, which is where obviously Charlton got him from and scored five in twelve. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. The player that was at Charlton but then did nothing, so then went to Swindon, who got him from Charlton. <laughs> Thanks for just clearing that one up for us there. Just in case you weren't too sure. Um yeah, I I don't think you can really look at the stats mean nothing in this game, I mean truthful, because it's it's a it's a game it's a team who needs points against a team who doesn't need points, and that tells you all you need to know about the result, I think, on Saturday. What, Sorry, Friday. Friday, yeah. Um what do you think or what do you want or what would you like to see from us? Is it a case of giving Egan, Fitzpatrick, Nightingale more opportunities? I think so. I think so. It's, it's given the players we've not. It's given the players that we think are going to be here next season. Um, so you know, show your hand a little bit because I think that's what you've got to do. It shows by what he's showing his hand. It looks like Tyrone Byrne's going to be here next season, which suggests to me he's got. A deal, he's already got another year on his contract. That's fair enough. That's the, if that's the deal we've done, then we have to go with that. Um, but it would be good, yeah, maybe to pay Alfie in there if Tom Saws is back. See how Tom Saws plays in with Alfie with Jake Reeves. Uh, I think it's not. It's not I think we're probably going to be seeing a loss of Danny Bourne. I'd be amazed if he gets another contract at the age of 58. Um, I joke. But, um, yeah, I think I just want to see a, a positive team in terms of, rather than just going for the motions, let's put a performance together. Let's do, the, let's do the other teams justice by just not turning up and rolling over. Um, that's all I'd say. And, um, you know, bring it into Peterborough, which probably, the, the game against Peterborough on Bank Holiday Monday is probably a dead rubber in all sense of purposes, isn't it? Yeah, I'm not looking forward to that. That's got pre-season written all over it, but Massive. who knows? Two teams that have got the pressure off might be an entertaining game if they just go out to enjoy themselves. Looking around, obviously we've got the bank holiday weekend, so there's two games coming up. Bolton are playing at 12.30 on Saturday. Is that because it's going to be live on TV? Potentially, I'm not sure. But anyway, they're away at Oldham. It might be because that's a Manchester derby, actually, but that seems to be the pick of the fixtures at both ends of the table for me, to be honest, because Bolton could ensure their promotion over the next couple of days. So, other than that, Charlton seems to be out of trouble, but they still have a big game at Gillingham, which would be interesting. Nothing yeah. else that really immediately screams out at me. Maybe I need to look a little bit harder. Um, well, do you know what? The fixture I think does look interesting is Gillingham against Bristol Rovers. Pure the fact that Gillingham are oh, seriously in trouble. You know, I can see Bristol Rovers going there and getting at least at least a point. Um, and then it really just depends on what Port Vale and teams like that do. Um, Swindon will... I, 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 I've got a feeling Swindon will beat us, I won't lie. Um, and then if Swindon win, Port Vale win, all of a sudden Gillingham needs to get something 100 Bristol Rovers and that's not a given by any stretch. Um, Gillingham are a team... Like, I, 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 I seriously believe in mind Gillingham are one team that could get caught up in all this. They go to Charlton on Monday as well, so Charlton have hit a bit of form, but no, Gillingham are the team I just fancy to get caught. Well, that will be a very interesting couple of games for them then. I'm sure we'll all be looking out to see because it is so tight down the bottom there. Port Vale on 45 points, Charlton are in 16th on 50, so there's still a good number of teams 
right in the mix, we're going to imagine that Chesterfield and Coventry are gone. In fact, they are. Let's be honest, they have gone. Yeah. So it's just whichever two joined them. So it'd be fascinating watching over the remaining of the season. I suppose, in a way, as much as we moan about boring games and us playing our season out, at least we're not involved in any of that. So yeah, just... go on. I look at that, and if I'm being truthful, if our team's going to go, Swin is a localish sort of game. Port Vale. I like, but I still... I'm quite a bitter person sometimes. I don't even forget things, but I still remember going to Port Vale and losing 3 nil midweek and their fans giving us loads of abuse about him going and seeing the whole thing with top of the league, being very blasé. And I'm just a bit of a cynical person sometimes. I remember these things. So, in a way, yeah, I don't mind seeing him getting relegated again. Is that horrible of me? Probably. We have to think there's a lot of long-distance trips coming back next season. I know we're losing Sheffield United. But Rotherham take their place, so like for like, really. looks like Wigan are coming down. Blackburn are likely to come down. Coming up already a Doncaster. Probably the return of Plymouth. Or like Portsmouth, perhaps not so bad. Hopefully Luton as well. But Think about Blackburn, going to Blackburn next year in League One, when you know, Premiership champions not that long ago under Jack Walker's leadership and Kenny Dalvish. Um, they mad going there, but I always think about all those kids that... They attracted when they Shearer and Sutton in the old SOS, and then um, they've now probably got man man voices now rather than those high pitched, horrible sounds that we used to have at Ewood Park. Unfortunately, when we go back there, there might be an, a lot of empty seats and they might be being filled up with free tickets to schools, Stu, so. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Possibly, possibly, but yeah, it's, it's a weird one, isn't it? It isn't funny. Isn't funny? That doesn't make any sense. No. Isn't football a funny old game? And on that note, Let's say goodbye for this week's show. <laughs> thank you very much for joining me, Stu. Thank you. Big, big thank you for listening. If you don't already, please follow us on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. Follow us at 9YRS Podcast and match day updates will be available for the next two games away at Swindon and then at home to Peterborough. Also check out the club's official YouTube and club's official Facebook to see us. As Stu mentioned earlier, with Kelly Jade Whelan, Tom Elliott and Jonathan Needs doing a few bits and pieces for your entertainment and enjoyment, of which you can, well, let us know if you are either entertained by it or you find enjoyment from it, and if you don't, well, sorry, tough, oh well, it's only a couple of minutes of your life, you'll get it back. Other than that, all that's left to say is please join us next week when we're going to be joined. Ah, uh, well, there's a little bit of explanation, I suppose, this week, Stu. I have to say, last week, I was full of praise for United Airlines. Yes, you were. Oh, dear. Oh, dear, dear, dear me. <laughs> you got well stand play, did you? Well, on at least two of my flights on United Airlines, I was offered the opportunity to miss my flight and go a day later in return for a sum of money because they had overbooked their flights now fortunately people volunteered themselves before i had to rearrange my movements but yeah well we've all seen the video haven't we so next week we're going to be joined by oscar munoz who is the ceo of united airlines until such time as we maybe have to throw him off the air you see what i've done there we'll see you next week if we've not overbooked the podcast Singing in the rain, what a glorious feel, and I'm happy again. I'm laughing at clouds so dark up above, and the sun's in my heart.